Hello again, historians. Welcome back. As you can see, this next topic we'll be looking at is ancient Egypt and Judaism. From our last unit level, where we talked about where civilization started, we now have one enormous development which allows us to help study and understand history better. That is written historical accounts, people writing things down. This will make it so much easier for when we're trying to understand a culture. With this new development, we are going to look at how Egypt's physical landscape and its significant, had a significance to its success of its civilization to the period of the known time, uh, known as the Old Kingdom, and what it might have been like to live in that period of time as a pharaoh or a peasant or a priest. Make sure you have your Unit Level 2 Lecture 1 sheet out and available to document your information and have all your distractions put away until the end. Trust me, you'll get a lot more out of it. Finally, please make sure that you are not skipping ahead in the video since there is a lot of information that I'll be talking about that is not necessarily on the worksheet, but you are still expected to know. Now with all that stuff done, let's get rolling. Setting the stage. As we discussed in Unit Level 1, Mesopotamia was one of the first civilizations in the world. However, it will be Egypt that will create one of the world's first empires. To do this, they were able to create unity, stability, and cultural continuity among its people and its territories. By now, you should all have an idea of where Africa is. Egypt is the northeasternmost part of the continent. Today, it is one of the most developed nations in Africa, despite some recent political problems that have occurred in the past few years. Back in the day, though, it would be the place to be. Most of Egypt is desert, which doesn't make Egypt sound all that nice of a place. However, we are going to focus our attention to a little corner in the northeastern part of the country here. If we zoom in close enough, here we'll find an area that is pictured on the left display. Let's take a look at what's so special about this little piece of Egypt. If you look closely at the inlay image on the last slide, you might have noticed something that kind of splits the picture in half. That blue was the Nile River. Let's take another quick look at it. The Nile is one of the largest rivers in the world and serves as the lifeline to all those who live near it. As we learned in Unit Level 1, civilizations would typically set up a home near a fresh water supply to help with the transportation of water, irrigation for food, <coughs> and fishing. The same goes here. The Nile was the heart of Egypt. Without it, there would be no Egypt. Now the Nile is the most important resource in Egypt and the surrounding areas. Besides being used for transportation, irrigation, and agriculture, it was also useful as a type of natural defense line. It was wide enough and deep enough during most parts of the year that it would prevent enemies from being able to get across it. We'll talk more about that later. Depending on who you talk to though, mo most geographers say that the Nile is the longest river in the world that spans about 4,100 miles long. Every year the Nile would flood, bringing with it rich soil that was left behind once the water would recede. Egyptians worshipped the Nile um, as a god, and because of that it was obviously worshipped as such, as a god. After all, if you rely on something to survive, wouldn't it be smart for you to treat it with the respect of a god? The flooding that I mentioned a minute ago worked like clockwork. It would flood very predictably, making it easy for the people to prepare for the harvest season. This was very different than the flooding that affected the Tigris and Euphrates rivers in the Mesopotamia, which would flood unexpectedly. 
One very unique thing about the Nile is that it flows from the south to the north. The southern region is at a higher altitude than that of the northern region of Egypt, and since water flows downhill, well, it goes a little backwards in what you'd expect. Keep this in mind as we're talking about the upper and lower areas of Egypt. The last important thing to realize is that when you get away from the Nile Valley, the surrounding area is parched desert. Virtually nothing can live there without some sort of assistance. No water, no vegetation, no animal life. Virtually inhospitable. So let's see visually how important this river is. This satellite image kind of speaks for itself when you look at it. Down here, you have what's known as the Upper Nile. And here, you have the Lower Nile. If you recall a minute ago, I mentioned how the river also acted as a type of natural defense. Well, when you look here on the image, you can see that on the west side of the Nile, there is virtually nothing but flat land and desert. Not anyone, really, no one really wants to live there. On uh, the east side, you can see that there's even more desert and even um, water, the Red Sea, to protect it. That being said, it was important that who was ever in control of Egypt be sure that he could defend both the northern and southern areas along the river, since these natural areas on the east and the west did a pretty good job of defending those areas. And there's the mountains that I mentioned uh, a second ago. There's a little bit of mountains there, too. There are three disadvantages, though. It all sounds like it was a perfect place to start a family, right? Well, not everything was perfect. Let's look at those disadvantages. First, if the river flooded a few feet too shallow or less than normal, thousands of people would starve. If the river flooded a few feet higher than normal, homes and property would be destroyed. And third, though the desert provided a great defense, it forced people to live close to the river and kind of tucked in between one another very closely because they needed it both for survival and as a natural barrier against invaders. As you just saw on the map, Egypt was sort of split into Upper and Lower Egypt. What the map didn't show you was that there's a third area called Nubia, which is even further south. What made, and what made Nubia special was that it was rich in gold. As you'll see here, that a king would have, eventually a king would take over Nubia in the southern part of Egypt and be in control of all things in the all populated regions of Egypt, creating the world's first empire. All right, now on to the history, which is what this class is all about, right? Back in the day, around 3000 BC, there was a king named Narmir who was able to unite both Upper and Lower Egypts into one larger empire. The Narmir palette, which is simply a, a stone that was found with writing on it, depicts with hieroglyphics how Namir was able to unify Egypt. Here's the picture of what this palette looked like. Now, some of you might be even wondering, or might have even heard, of this guy Namir before. He was sometimes called the Scorpion King. Historians, though, aren't sure if he truly was the Scorpion King, or if Narmir had come right after him. Narmir is credited with, by most to have created Egyptian, Egypt's first dynasty. He would be where the several next generations of leaders would start. 
In the end, Egypt would see 31 different dynasties spanning over 2,600 years. By today's standards, that is an amazing feat to have an empire last that long, despite the number of families that ended up ruling it. And here we see The Rock as a Scorpion King. Not so much. It was a good movie, but has nothing to do with the real Scorpion King that history tells us about. So, let's take a look at some of the players during this period known as the Old Kingdom, which is our next section. The Old Kingdom is also known as the Age of Pyramids. You can probably guess why. This was from about 2660 to 2180 BC when we see many patterns for Egyptian civilization being established. As you probably know already, a pyramid is just an immense stone structure often built for tombs. Let's take a closer look at it. Now I know a lot about Egypt's history, but not everything. What historians have been able to figure out with pretty much cert with pretty good certainty is that this would have been the first pyramid, or at least the first pyramid that survived. It was a pyramid built by the Egyptian king Dozier, and it's called the Step Pyramid. It was the first pyramid that we know of in Egypt. An interesting fact about this pyramid that it was designed by his high advisor, known as Imhotep. For those of you keeping track of Imhotep, he was also the, one of the main characters in the movie, The Mummy. Yeah, that guy was Imhotep. Again, taking these names, putting them out of place. Yeah, it's what movies do. Moving on. Here we see on the left uh, what we is known as the Bent Pyramid. You can probably figure out why it's called that. It was built for Snefru. He was around 2400 BC. Snefru also built the Red Pyramid, which we see on the right. Before these, Snefru had actually built another period known as the Medium Pyramid, which took more of a square shape from top to bottom. It is unknown if these pyramids would, be, would have been used as the tomb for Snefru, since his body has never been found within any of these three pyramids, or actually has never been found at all. So they don't actually know if the purpose of these pyramids was for ceremonial, for, to act as a tomb, or what they were for. Eventually, though, the power of the pharaohs declined, and that would be the end of the Old Kingdom. 